This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Hi, my name is Danny Mack and I have previously worked for Disney, DreamWorks and Pixar. Well, not really, but it sounds good, doesn't it? This time last year, I made a video where I took one of Cameron Mark's many awesome drawings and explained how I turned it into this 3D model. The legend that is Cameron Mark has once again agreed to let me translate one of his drawings into 3D. And in this video, we're gonna see how I did that using ZBrush, Blender, 3D Core, and Photoshop. I will say up front that the most difficult part of the process was choosing a drawing because he is so good. So do go check him out using the link in the description. But let's not waste any time and get into it. And the first thing I did was make the most basic shape of the skull by pulling down the front, pushing in the sides, and marking out the back of the jaw. Then I pull out a neck and use spotlight to check the proportions against the reference. Now next I added some basic shapes for the ears and body and matched them to the reference as best I could while still retaining symmetry. Now asymmetry is important in the final piece but symmetry is useful in the earlier stages for speeding things up like retopology and creating UVs. I curve in the eye sockets and around where the nose will be. I'm always keeping one eye on the reference, which is on another screen to help guide the proportions, but I don't expect to get them perfect at this stage. I'm concentrating more on finding shapes and plane changes common to all heads first, and then later I'll start pushing it more towards the reference. Now, I don't often sculpt mouths wide open like this, but for the upper lip, the process is much the same. And this is because when you open your mouth, the upper lip isn't actually affected that much since it's the bottom lip that does all the moving, or rather, the bottom jaw. Regardless of the pose though, when you're sculpting lips, it's useful to know that they wrap around the teeth. So when I sculpt an open mouth, I add some in to help. I don't need to sculpt a full set of teeth though, just add in a cylinder to approximate them for now. And for a similar reason, I add in a pair of spheres to represent eyeballs and position them appropriately. Now might be a good time to check against the reference. Now working like this can mess the sculpt up pretty bad, so it's better to do it now before we start adding detail. For the eyelashes, I jumped over to Blender because I think the speed retop or add-on is perfect for this, but ZBrush is more than capable too. I find having a block eyelash like this is really helpful for finding the shape of the eyelid. At this point, I spend a bit of time working and refining the shapes that I've already laid down. Switching materials every now and again is a good way to see your model in a different light. For the clothing, I mask out the shape and extract it like so, run Z remesher on it a few times and start tweaking. Then it's back over to Blender again to create some brows. I could just use extract in ZBrush like we did with the clothing, but doing it like this gives us decent topology right from the beginning. The eyes tend to be a bit easier to work out if you have the pupils and iris marked out, but again, there's no need to get too detailed. Just a couple of black dots is fine. And just for the fun of it, I point the eyes down like in the reference. At first I did this in Blender because in Blender you can rotate them both at the same time from their individual origins and have them point in exactly the same direction. However, back in ZBrush, I remembered that even though the eyes are physically looking in the same direction, this doesn't necessarily look correct to the camera. And so I ended up tweaking them anyway. Now I started the hair by masking out the area from which I wanted it to grow and extracting a mesh. At this point, I'm just looking for a nice shape, paying close attention to the silhouette. And for the curl at the front, I added a sphere and just started working it out. 
create the hairband, I hid the hair and then mastate the shape before extracting. Then from here, I kept Z remeshing it at half resolution until it was low enough to modify the topology by hand. Now I just want to take a moment to briefly talk about the sponsor of this video, which is Skillshare. I'm sure you know by now that Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes covering all sorts of skills such as animation, illustration and graphic design, amongst a bunch more too. The classes are designed to explore new skills, deepen existing passions and get lost in creativity. And one class that particularly caught my eye was this one by Southern Shotty 3 d who is awesome by the way, called Bring Your Illustrations to Life with Blender 3D. I've always thought about how cool it would be to bring one of my characters to life with animation, but I find the idea of animating my characters really intimidating because, well, character animation is really, really hard. But this class taught me that animation doesn't necessarily mean directing a full-on movie with storyboards and voice actors. You can add so much life to an image with some fairly simple looping animation, which I thought was really cool. The Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, so there are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes, so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And as a nice little bonus, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring your creativity today. Now I won't dwell on retopology since I have a few in-depth tutorials which I'll link below. But you can see why symmetry is useful here because it means I only have to work on one side and the other is done automatically. Since people often ask me what the point of retopology is, it's essentially to simplify how the underlying object is put together. This improves just about everything down the pipeline, but particularly rigging and rendering. But what it does mean is that when I send it back to ZBrush, I've lost the high resolution details from the previous model, but we can always bring those back by subdividing the new model and projecting the old details back. However, I didn't really bother doing that with this one though, because the details on the old model were quite messy anyway, so I used this to my advantage to clean them up. I then went back to 3D Core and repeated this process for the clothing. Now one of the nice things about Blender is the Solidify modifier, which adds thickness without adding extra geometry. You can actually do this with ZBrush too, using dynamic subdiff. You just need to make sure the thickness is turned up. Now at this point, I want to fix the curl at the front, but I'm not 100% sure what's going on. But of course, that's where YouTube comes in. Don't forget there's a ton of useful information outside the realm of 3D that's bound to be useful to you including stuff like makeup, clothing and photography. Then it's your job to translate that into your own work. I sketch on the curl with clay build-up to help me understand the directionality of the hair a bit better. I can't really tell from the drawing what the back of the hair is supposed to look like, but I found a similar style where this was a bun, so I went with that idea. By now I'm thinking that I want to start laying down hair strands and for that I want to transition to working in Blender. So I send everything over and add a floor. Now the floor might seem unnecessary but once we start rendering the floor will provide a bounce light and make the scene look more realistic. I also added a camera and lighting which will eventually help us shade the model. But for now I'm just interested in that hair. To create the first strand I added both a path curve and a bezier circle. I then made the circle the bevel object of the curve and tweaked the shape to be more blocky. And this defines the cross section of the hair and the nice thing is that we can edit the shape whenever we want since this workflow is non-destructive. From here I can get to work placing our first strand around the curl that I made earlier. Then once it's in place I can duplicate it to speed up the placement of the next one. And notice that I'm leaving the strands grey for now, otherwise they would be difficult to see. Now as I said a moment ago, we can tweak the shape of the cross section on the fly. Notice how changes in the top window affect the hairs in the bottom. Again I have a detailed tutorial for this linked in the description. I repeat this process until the base hair is all but covered. Now what I want to do next is start colouring this head, but in order to do that, we need to UV unwrap it. 
Again, this is not something I want to dwell on, but if you're new to 3D, this essentially means cutting up the model so that it can be laid flat like this. And I don't think I've actually made an in-depth tutorial about this, but there's plenty out there. Just search for UV unwrapping. And once this is done, we can move on to painting the model. Now, the way I usually approach this is by first laying down a base colour and then adding a little bit of red to rosy up the cheeks and nose. I also add a slightly darker tone where the eye sockets are. I wouldn't normally go so red with the lips, but this is a pin-up character so it suits. It's worth noting though that none of these colours are set in stone because they can always be tweaked in Blender once they've been baked onto a texture map. And now I think it's time to replace those eyes. And for this I'm using the eye designer add-on, which you'll find linked below. And it's an add-on for very quickly creating really nice eyes and tweaking the settings to your liking. And just like that, our eyes are done. I played around with a couple of material ideas for the clothing before working out how to create the polka dot, which I achieved procedurally with a Voronoi texture. I tried for a while to position them so that they didn't cross the UV seam, but it was futile. So I simply moved the UV seam to the back, off camera, and unwrapped it again. Sneaky. I think it's finally time to start adding asymmetry by sculpting in the pose, which I do on a shape key so that we can return to our symmetrical pose if we need to. Now, I did start this off in Blender, but I shortly decided to send it over to ZBrush for this. Then once I'm done, I can just send it back and add it as a shape key. Now if you look at the neck of the character in the concept, you'll see that there's a bit of a lean which is important to the gesture. So for this I set up a really basic rig. Good job we still have our symmetrical version of the model. I start posing the head but this weird body is putting me off, so I paint an opacity map to hide the parts that I don't want to see. Now before I started rendering this, I imported the reference image and checked my model against it. Particularly from the camera view, bearing perspective distortion in mind. It was actually quite off from the reference, so I ended up reworking it for a couple of hours, trying to get it to match up. I also added a few missing bits like the lower lashes. Now, eventually I tackled one of the most difficult parts of the project and decided it was good enough to hit render. I wasn't yet happy with the colours, but I'll experiment with those when I bring all the passes into Photoshop. Lots of tweaking later, and we finally ended up with... Now before you leave, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you feel so inclined, and I will see you in the next one.